Hey guys, Frank Spear back with you for another very short video today. Want to look quickly at Genesis, cutting my head off here. Genesis, which is not a bad thing. A little uh, video decapitation never hurt anybody. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. We all know it. We love it. We live it. <laughs> well, hopefully we don't live it. Genesis 2, 17. Well, let's start in 16. But the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. I believe that's covenant death, cut off from the covenant, from this covenant of grace and faith that you're now walking in with God. You'll be cut off from that covenant. I believe death is used that way primarily throughout the Bible. On the day Adam did transgress that command and eat from that tree, he did not physically die. He did not biologically die. He lived a long, long, long time afterward. Turn over to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. The serpent here, the uh, wicked ruler of some sort, this human being, he says this opposer, this enemy, this adversary, this enemy of Adam... And of God says, verse 5, For God knows that in the day that you eat from this tree, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, in the day that Adam did partake from that tree, were his eyes literally opened? Were they closed beforehand and he couldn't see anything? Was he blind? And then he ate from that tree and his eyes were, his physical, biological eyes were opened? No. No. This is, of course, referring to something spiritually that would happen to him. And in a negative, with a negative connotation. It's the same with the death. Now, if we look up those words in the original Hebrew, the eyes will literally be referring, be referring to literal eyes in their sockets. Human eyeballs, right? But that doesn't mean that that's what's being talked about here. It's being used as a metaphor. Same with death. There are people that say, well, the word death, when you look it up, means biological death, physical death, dying. So, therefore, how could it not be referring to biological death? Well, the, the word is being used in a metaphoric sense, just like clouds or heavens, so forth and so on in the scriptures. Uh, kings are being deposed from their thrones, and it's being referred to metaphorically as stars falling from the heavens. If you look up that word stars... It's a reference to a literal star in the sky, but it's being used metaphorically, parabolically. Okay, now, so the day that Adam ate from that tree, he died. Okay, and that was the death, the covenant death, that Israel was struggling with throughout the entire scriptures, all the way up until through the New Testament. Now, if you'd open up as one example to 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, Let's begin reading in verse 10. But now it has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Messiah Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Do you know that there's a word in there in Greek that they do not put into the English text? And man, has that screwed us up. The definite article is there, the, in Hebrew, H-O, ho. Okay, so ho, 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 a minute here. It should read like this. Who has abolished the death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I believe this is referring to the death that Adam received in the garden. It was that covenantal death that being excluded from the original covenant that God had with Adam, and then being placed under the covenant of flesh and blood, the system of animal sacrifices, and, and temporarily covering, covering over the transgressions, the wrongdoing of that nation. It's the death. And the same is true all throughout the scripture. In Romans, especially when Paul is talking about the death that Adam brought, that definite article should be in the text. The death. The death. The specific death, this is a qualifier. The definite article is a qualifier that shows that he's not talking about biological death. That was never extinguished, even by Jesus. Even they were dying. Listen, 
but now has it has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ, who abolished death, past tense. So if he abolished death, biologically, then none of them should have physically died afterward, after what Christ did on the cross. But they did. Paul himself died, biologically, physically. Because it's not talking about that kind of death. It's talking about the death, the condemnation, the curse that came back in Eden, that was removed by Christ, therefore allowing those Israelites who lived under that covenant of death, Romans 6, 7, 8, to come out from underneath it and begin the new kingdom in which there is no Jew, no Gentile, no slave, no free, no male, no female. Those old covenant distinctions disappeared because of what Christ made possible. Okay? And then when the new kingdom began, those distinctions were gone and it was a whole new ball game from that point forward that had nothing to do with Torah. We don't need to be saved out, rescued out from under the curse of Torah. That's the whole theme of the New Testament. Just finished reading this morning through Galatians again, and it couldn't be made more plain. Let's flip over there. Galatians, let's go to chapter 2. Should have my glasses on because it helps me actually see. They help me see, which is a good thing. Let's uh, begin with verse 15 of Galatians 2. For we are we are Jews by nature. We're Israelites. And we're not sinners from among the Gentiles. Now, I believe Gentiles here. The word is better translated peoples or nations. Gentiles put the word Gentiles puts a difficult connotation on the word, on the original Hebrew word here, a uh, Greek word, ethnos, which is just talking about peoples. And I believe it's talking about the people of Israel, foreigners who converted to Israel, included in that. who were scattered, the diaspora, who were scattered among the nations of the known world at the time, living many of them like pagans, like they weren't Israelites at all. And Paul is calling them out from those nations, saying, our Messiah has come. Return to your roots here and be rescued out from the wrath of God that's to come upon Israel for their rejection of Messiah. You don't want to be in that camp. For we are Jews by nature and not law transgressors, sinners from among the Gentiles. We're the Jews. We're the circumcised group. We're from the tribe of Judah. We're the ones that have the temple in Jerusalem. We're the ones that have the priesthood and so forth and who are maintaining that system. We are the ones who are married to God the Father. The ten northern tribes were divorced 700 years earlier. And they scattered and were dispersed among the nations after they came out from Assyria. They, be, they settled in Samaria, a lot of them, but many of them were scattered out among the nations, living like Greeks, living among the Romans, paying no attention whatsoever to their God. For all intents and purposes, they were Gentiles. They were foreigners. That's how the Jews considered them. They were uncircumcised. They were not Torah-keeping, so forth and so on. So Paul's ministry was to them to reconcile them back into this new body. Jew and Gentile, breaking down the wall of partition between the two groups, the ten northern tribes and the southern tribes of Judah. That's what Ephesians is all about. But included in those numbers were the foreigners who were not ethnic blood Israelites who had converted to the house of Israel. So all the groups are contained uh, in the uh, gospel outreach of the New Testament to come out from that old house of Israel and into the new house of Israel that would become the founding fathers of the new kingdom where those distinctions of Israelite, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female would go away once the new kingdom arrived. But they were living under that still until the new kingdom arrived. Those distinctions existed and they were calling them out from among it. Now watch this, verse 16, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of Torah, you can't be justified, be made, put in right standing. They couldn't be, because they were under Torah, not you and me. Torah ended 2,000 years ago. Right? We were never under it. 
So we never had to be saved, rescued, justified, out from under it. They did. Once they were, they became the founders of the new kingdom that had nothing to do with that anymore. Therefore, when you and I come into the new kingdom, it has nothing to do with that justification or that rescue. We're, we become believers in God the Father by faith, just like Adam before the fall. Simple faith. Watch this. Nevertheless, not knowing that a man... Now, man, Adam, even though this is anthropos in Greek, the root word stems back to the Hebrew word Adam, you know, and, and Ish. This is the covenant man, the man in the garden, Adam. They all, all Israel sprang out from Adam genetically, Right? Noah comes out from the line of Adam and Abraham goes out from the line of Noah and then the 12 tribes of Israel come out from the line of Abraham and so forth. The, the, the genealogy in Luke traces Jesus, who is from the line of Judah, that tribe, all the way back to Adam. So Adam is proto-Israel. He's the founding father of Israel. Nevertheless, knowing that a man, an Adam, those who are in Adam, an Israelite, is not justified by the works of Torah. They were never made right, these Israelites. They were never put in right standing with God by law-keeping. Law-keeping was given because of man's wickedness, for their, their, their evil-doing, their wrong-doing. It was given to them as... Um, what, how do I want to say? It was given to them as a standard which to live by so they know when they were doing wrong and when they were doing right. Okay? Watch this. But they're not justified, placed in right standing before God by keeping the law because none of them could keep it perfectly and you would have had to have kept it perfectly to be in right standing with God. Watch this. But we're justified through faith, belief, trust in Messiah Yeshua. Even we, the Jews, he says, even we, the Jews, as opposed to the ten northern tribes who were scattered among the nations, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, speak, even though we, watch this, even though we are the Torah keepers as the Jews, we have the temple system in Jerusalem, we have the priesthood, we have the sacrifices, he says, even we are justified by Christ. We all, as Israelites, need Messiah. We're justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of Torah. We're not justified by these animal sacrifices and celebrating the Passover and all the other feasts. And we're not, we're not uh, um, justified by God, um, by uh, the traditions of Judaism and so forth and all that was heaped upon the Torah law. He says, watch this, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. That flesh is referring to Israelites. I've shown that in other videos. Watch this, verse 17. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ alone by faith, we ourselves have been also found sinners, is Christ then a minister, a dispenser of sin? May it never be. Is he a deacon of sin? No. Here's what Paul's saying here. He says, if we're just seeking to be justified by faith in Messiah alone, and by doing so, we're actually transgressing God's law, as some say we are, by putting our faith in Christ as Messiah, then that means Christ brought about our sin. And he says, of course, that's ludicrous. He says, if I rebuild what I have destroyed, then I prove myself to be a transgressor of the law. Right? Because for through the law, I died to the law. This is Romans 6, Romans 7. I died to the law so that I might live to God. Paul goes on to say that the law doesn't matter, the Torah doesn't matter anymore under the new covenant system. Watch, I, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. How would he nullify it? Cancel it out. Discount it. Invalidate it. How? He says, I don't cancel out the grace of God because if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. See what he's saying? If I try to gain righteousness or right standing with God by law keeping, then I cancel out what Christ did on the cross when he took away the death. 
the condemnation, the curse of the law. What was the curse of the law? The curse of the law was no one could keep it perfectly. So they had to be temporarily covered over with animal blood as substitutes for their own blood, their own physical death, until Messiah came, and when he poured out his blood, he canceled out their debt once for all. Then the old system ended, right, in AD 70. And now, today, 2,000 years later, when you want to worship the God of the Bible and serve him, you don't have anything to do with this system. This was canceled out a long time ago. The Torah debt, the curse under Torah, the death of Adam that they were under as Israelites. That was all gone. Okay? Watch this. Oh, sorry, knocked my camera. Let's look quickly at chapter 3. Let's start in verse 23. Well, let's back up a little more. Verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Of course not, he says. For if the law had been given, or if a law had been given which was able to impart righteousness, to impart new covenant life, to impart the life that Adam lost in the garden. So he says, if there was a law that could bring that life back, watch this, then righteousness would have been based on the law. But you couldn't bring back the life that Adam lost. You couldn't get out from under that covenant of death with the law. He says, well, then what was the purpose of the law? He says, because of men's transgressions, Israel's sin. God needed to rein them in somehow, because look at Genesis chapter 6. He says, there's hardly anyone righteous left on the, on, in, in the land. So the law was eventually given at the time of Moses, right? 430 years after the covenant he made with Abraham, which Paul talks about here, which was by faith. Abraham was made righteous by believing God. But the law came 430 years later. So how could Abraham have been made righteous when he didn't have Torah? That's Paul's point because righteousness was never based on Torah. Torah came to rein in the sin of the Israelites. To, to hold them accountable by an outward standard that they didn't have up until then. That's the point of Torah. Now watch this. This is mind-blowing. We were never under Torah. We're, we're, the, the, the natural law, if you want to call it that, the natural moral law that is in every human is something other than what Torah was, right? We come into this world knowing, just instinctively, you know, a little kid takes a toy from another little kid, then he looks at his parent like this, even if he's one year old, he looks up because he realizes, or she realizes, I've done something wrong. They could feel it, they can sense it. We're not talking about that moral law here in Torah. Of course, that was at the core of it, at the base of it, right? And, 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 and how we come into fellowship with God today is by being good, by obeying that moral law that's instinctual in us. And when we do wrong, we repent, we tell God we're sorry, and we move on, and we do better. Paul says in Romans 1 or 2, he says, to those who do good, Righteousness and immortality to those who do bad, who do wicked, who do evil. Death. Cut off from fellowship with God. It's always been about doing good. But the Israelites didn't have a standard, so God brought them in. And he said, let's see how you live under this. Well, how did they fare? Not so hot. But they were never put in right standing with God by that Torah law. They were put in right standing with God by loving him from the heart and loving their fellow man from the heart. Like David. Look at David. David sinned up a storm. David had a David took a man's wife, just as one instance. He took a man's wife from him, committed adultery. Right? He coveted a man's wife, took her for himself, committed adultery, then had that man killed by putting him in the front lines of battle so that he could have his wife for his own. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that. And yet God says, David is a man after my own heart. He loves me. You see? David loved God from the inside, recognized his wrong, paid the price for his transgression, but yet he loved God inwardly and God considered that righteousness. 
Now watch this. Verse 22. Oh, let's start from 21 again. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God, which was by faith, righteousness by faith? No, it's not contrary to it. May it never be. For if a law had been given, which was able to impart life, the life that Adam lost, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture, watch this, that's the old covenant scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, but the scripture has imprisoned everyone under sin, under law transgression, has shut up, imprisoned everyone in Israel because they alone had Torah. Israel alone had Torah. But the scripture, that's the Hebrew scripture, Right? It doesn't say, but the Hebrew scriptures shut up the Chinese people or the German peoples under Torah. The scripture had nothing to do with them. They didn't have those scriptures. They would have known nothing of Moses. But the scripture has shut up everyone, meaning, not all humanity, but everyone to whom Paul is speaking. And he's always speaking and writing to Israel. But the scripture has imprisoned all Israel under law transgression so that the promise by faith in Messiah Jesus might be given to those of Israel who believe. Now remember, foreigners, non-Israelites, could convert to the house of Israel. If I were a foreigner in the first century, let's say, or even in the seventh century BC, and I said, hey, Israelites, I really love your God. And I want to. I believe your God is the true God, and I want to worship and serve Him. What do I do? They would have said, "Be circumcised in your flesh and believe, and then put yourself under the laws of Torah." What do you say today if you want to believe in the? What would you they have said in the first century during this time that Paul is writing? Hey, Israelites, I believe in your Messiah and that He is the Son of God, and I believe that your God is the one true God. What do I do to become a part of this household of faith? this body of believers, this community of faith. They would have said, put your faith in Jesus as Messiah. They wouldn't have said, get circumcised and convert to Judaism, then get out of Judaism when the new kingdom comes, right? That's what these arguments were about, these dissensions in the first century church because they were trying to figure that out. What do we do now? When a foreigner comes along or a, an Israelite from the 10 northern tribes and says, I want to believe in Messiah, do we circumcise him and make him a Jew? First, and that they, they, they argued about that. Even Paul in this very letter says, I had to rebuke Peter to his face because even after Acts chapter 10, where Peter saw the vision of the clean animals, the unclean animals that were now made clean, saying that don't call any people, right, that the northern tribes or foreigners, don't call them unclean anymore. That's gone in this new covenant system. Peter got it, and then he must have forgot it. Because Paul says I had to rebuke him to his face. He was eating with the scattered Israelites, the non-Jewish Israelites, and the converts who were not circumcised. He was fellowshipping with them until some from James came and Peter got nervous and said, oh, I can't fellowship with you guys anymore. And Paul said, what? What's going on here? What are you, what are you bringing Torah into this for? What are you bringing circumcision into this for? Don't you understand what Messiah came to do? And he rebuked them. Now watch this. But the scripture, the Hebrew scripture, has shut up Hebrews under law transgression, sin, harmatea, the missing the mark of Torah, so that the promise of faith, being justified by faith, getting that life of Adam back by faith, so that the promise of faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, and we were still under Torah, under the sacrificial system, under Judaism, we were kept in custody, jail, prison, under the law, being shut out to the faith, which was later to be revealed. That's the mystery that Paul talks about. Therefore, Watch this. Torah has become our tutor, our guide, our school marm to lead us to Christ. He says, Torah took us by the hand and brought us, led us to Messiah. That was its purpose. Not to 
justify us, not to sanctify us, not to give us that Adam life back that he lost. The law just led us to Messiah, kept us shut up in prison until Messiah came and set us free. That's the death. That's the covenant death, the prison they were in. Watch this. Verse 24. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Messiah so that we may be justified by faith in him. Verse 25. But now that faith has come, we Israelites are no longer under a tutor. We are no longer under Torah. We are no longer under Judaism. We are no longer under the old covenant system. We are released from the old marriage covenant and being brought into a new marriage covenant. We are no longer the old sons of God via ethnic Israel. But we are now the new sons of God via faith in Jesus Christ for all. Watch this. Verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now remember, they had not received the new kingdom yet. They had not received the promise. Right? If you flip over to... Well, let me finish this. They had not yet received it, but and they wouldn't receive it until 70 AD when the Old Covenant disappeared. Right? Revelation chapter 20. And I saw a new heavens and a new earth, for the old heavens and the old earth had passed away. For I saw a new covenant kingdom, because the old covenant kingdom had passed away. For I saw life in Christ, because death in Adam had passed away. For I saw the new marriage happening, because the old marriage had passed away. I saw the new sons of God because the old sons of God had passed away. I saw the wheat because the tares had passed away. I saw the sheep because the goats had passed away. Use whatever metaphor, parabolic metaphor we want to use from the New Testament. Watch this, verse 27, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Those are the wedding garments. Matthew 25. You've clothed yourself with Christ. You've put him on. That covers you now. Not the old, not the blood sacrifice of animals anymore. Right? Like Adam in the garden after the fall. Had to be covered with animal skins. Blood sacrifice. Now you've put on Christ. Those, that's your new clothing. You see? You're in that life now that Adam lost. Watch this. That's the resurrection. That's the resurrection of the New Testament. That's the promised resurrection of the Old Testament. Here it comes. Verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, that means you died in Him, right? Have clothed yourself with Christ. There is now neither, neither Jew nor Greek dispersed ten northern tribes among the Greeks. Right? There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. You're all one new man, new person in Christ Jesus. So now today, that all of that ended 2,000 years ago. And what was left but the new man? Christ died to make this possible. And so today you believe by simple faith like they were they were coming out of the old covenant system by simple faith in Messiah. Right? We never had to come out of the old covenant system. We never had to come out of Adam's death because Adam wasn't the first human being and we did not all all human beings did not become sinners in Adam. Israel became transgressors in Adam. What was God doing with all the other nations of the world while all this was going on? under the Old Covenant system, while the Old Testament was being uh, written, and while those things were happening, what was going on all over the world? Well, the Bible tells us nothing about it. But here's my best guess. God is God is God. And any nation that was worshiping God in a way that pleased God, that was being obedient to the innate moral law of right and wrong, Anyone who was being obedient to that had their own name for God. And if they were living good, if they were living in accordance with the inner moral law, then that's God's business, right? To justify them, 
to call them righteous, however he worked with all peoples who've ever lived on the planet. If they were wicked, if they were evil, if they lived contrary to the innate moral laws, then God would deal with them in life and after biological death how he will. Uh, how much more can we know about that than that? What our concern is, is teaching this book. And since I worship the God of this book, that's where I find my focus. But look at all religions of the world at their core. Not how they get screwed up as they build layers upon it, right? But at their core, I shouldn't say all, most, most valid religions. Th think about the, the, the big three world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, okay? Uh, at the core of them, they have good moral behavior. Now, you can make a strong case against Islam for, you know, slaughtering the infidel. And I know people are going to say, well, let's go back to the early days of Christianity and look at the wars and, 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 and look at the... Yeah, there are lots of uh, evil things done in the name of Christ or the name of God that God didn't sanction necessarily, but people do them. People are wicked. They use the name of God in wrong ways. They use the name of God to do their evil. But that isn't God's fault. You got wackos all over the place, always have, always will, saying, God told me to do this, and then they go off and do something incredibly evil. Does that mean God did indeed tell them to do it? Of course not. Anyway, I'm off the track here. There's neither Jew, nor Greek, nor slave, nor free. Those distinctions are gone. They were distinctions of the old covenant system of Torah. Those have been gone for 2,000 years. Therefore, we don't need to be rescued out from that system. Right? Do we need to be rescued from anything? Okay, well, if you want to put it, if you want to use that word salvation or rescue, if you're a wicked person and you say, I'm going to start believing in God now and start living righteous because I believe there's a God now and I want to honor him in my life. And if there's life after death, I want to have part of that life. So I'm going to be good now. I'm going to behave myself. I'm not going to do the wicked things anymore. I'm not going to beat my wife anymore. I'm not going to be a drunkard anymore. Or I'm not going to be a liar or a thief. Right? Or I'm not going to be a deceiver. So forth and so on. Whatever you want to throw in. I'm not going to be an adulterer anymore. Or even the, gr the, 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 uh, the worst sins. Right? Maybe, I don't even want to name them. But you know what I mean. Maybe you've murdered or raped or something. And you, now you're sorry, genuinely, from the inside. Look at David. He murdered. He committed adultery. So today, we, if, if somebody wants to do that, wh what would you say to somebody who comes? You've got you've got to be circumcised or put yourself under Torah and then come out of that and be saved out of it. You know, you're under Adam death. No. You say, believe. Put your faith in the God of the Bible who loves you, who created you. Right? What, is, what does James say? Those who believe must believe, those who are righteous or be righteous must believe that God is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The, that's, those are the constituent elements for entering into covenant relationship with God in the new kingdom. Those are the requirements. Faith in God. Jesus emphasized that in the new kingdom, uh, it would be worship of his father. That's what he emphasized. John chapter 4. John chapter 14. Right? And, and many other passages. Well, we've gone long. We've gone over a half an hour. They had not received yet the new covenant. Right? Now look at this. One more thing I want to look at before we get out of here today. Oh, this is a little complicated. I probably shouldn't have jumped into this today. But I just wanted to show that Paul goes on to make an analogy here, to draw an analogy from Hagar. He says, now Hagar, which was Abraham's foreign wife, right? Egyptian wife, I believe. He says, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem and Judaism. Okay? So Abraham had these two children, right? Isaac and Ishmael, and Ishmael was born from Hagar uh, by the flesh, Paul says. 
In other words, it wasn't a miraculous birth, but Isaac was a miraculous birth. All right? So Abraham and Hagar had a child, Ishmael, by the good old-fashioned way. And remember, under Israel, having children was vital to keep the covenant people going. Right? That was their eternal life to keep the covenant people going. Must have children, must have male children, male children, male children. That's why it was so important all throughout the Old Testament. He says, but that, that child, Ishmael, came from the flesh, the, the ordinary way, right? It was an Israel thing. He says, but Isaac was the child of promise, right? Sarah couldn't have children, but God miraculously opened her womb and said, through this baby, through this child, right? Messiah would eventually come. Through this child would be the righteous seed, the righteous line. That's where the Israelites came from. They, Jacob came out of that line. They became the 12 tribes. And remember too, God loved Ishmael, right? He didn't choose him to be the covenant people, the 12 tribes, but he loved them and Ishmael became a separate group of people who would have become far a foreign nation living around Israel. But do you think God discarded them ultimately? No, he tells, if you go back and read the story, he tells Hagar, I will make a great nation out of your son. I'll take care of him. He had concern for them. God did not hate every nation but Israel. That's another story. Now, verse 25. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds metaphorically, Paul says, to the present Jerusalem, right? To the present Jerusalem, to Judaism, because she is in slavery with her children. Judaism is a fleshly kingdom, right? Out of covenant with God because it had become apostate. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you leaders of Judaism, you're hypocrites. You're far away from God, yet you think you're close. He says, watch this, verse 26. But the Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, is free, not in bondage. She is our mother. Sarah is our mother. And she corresponds to the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, it's difficult typology here. But not really difficult, but if you understand the scriptures, right? So he's talking about the Jerusalem from Above the heavenly Jerusalem is the literal translation here, which is what we see in Revelation 21 and 22. Okay? And that's the Jerusalem. They were escaping the old Jerusalem with its bondage of Torah and the curse and the Adam death and coming into the new Jerusalem that was free from all of that. Not in some invisible heavenly realm, but here on earth in a completely new covenant system that was devoid of all that was included in Adam, death, and Torah. Thank you guys for listening today. I'll see you next time.